Wolf Farmer Jesse here today. We are continuing our obviously very super cool series on the principles of soil health, supported in part by a grant from Southern Sayer. If you've randomly sort of stumbled upon this series, uh, you do not have to watch them all in any sort of order. It is not a whodunit crime series. Could be a whodunit crime series, but the videos are kind of one whole package together, so... Essentially, we are simply giving context to the four basic principles of soil health as laid out by conservation agriculture and nature herself. These rules say essentially that maintaining healthy soil is about keeping the soil covered as much as possible, disturbing it as little as possible, and keeping it planted as much as possible with a sort of side salad of biodiversity, sometimes literally in salad form. Anyway, in the last video, we focused on keeping the soil covered with the many whys and hows to do so. And in this video, we are going to focus our efforts on keeping the soil planted as much as possible. So let's do it. First things first, if you're not subscribed to this channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And if you are subscribed, you're awesome. Also, if you're enjoying this series and would like a deeper dive into these principles, consider picking up a copy of my book, The Living Soil Handbook, available now at notillgrowers.com. You can obviously purchase it in a lot of places, but proceeds from that particular sale at notillgrowers.com go into making more content for you like this. Okay, so the subject of today's video is keeping the soil planted as much as possible, but why? What is the actual deal with keeping living roots in the soil? Uh, why is it an important part of soil health? Well, I'd like to introduce you to my good pal, photosynthesis. You are familiar with this term. This is where plants convert water, sunlight, and carbon dioxide into carbohydrates, which is actually kind of a dramatic oversimplification of probably the most important chemical reaction on our planet. And inevitably someone will point out that technically it is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, or G3P that is created through photosynthesis. That's what's turned into carbohydrates, but that person actually paid attention in biology class, unlike the rest of us who were drawing Wu-Tang symbols in our textbooks. Who's Wu-Tang? You're fired. Quite literally every single living creature on the planet, to one degree or another, relies on photosynthesis and those carbohydrates I mentioned. Carbohydrates just being little molecular energy bars. Um, that includes birds, bugs, bats, brahmas, billy goats, babies, all the bee creatures, but all the others as well, they are all constructed from and live off of the carbohydrates created through and from photosynthesis, which I agree makes plants a little bit important. So let's just take a second to understand why photosynthesis in plants are so critical to soil health. So plants create glucose and other carbohydrates through the photosynthetic process. Then they use some of those carbohydrates for their own construction. You know, leaves, stems, fruit, roots, all the things plants need, like some bark if you're a tree, or a mouth, I guess, if you're a Venus flytrap. But also, plants share a fairly sizable percentage of those carbohydrates with the soil in the form of tasty snacks, if you're a microbe, called exudates. These are dynamic substances rich with various fatty acids and amino acids and many other compounds that plants combine in their own sort of specialized way, then push out through their roots into the soil. They're sort of like little sunshine smoothies that the various microbial creatures such as bacteria and fungi can consume. But these exudates truly drive soil life. Each species of plant has its own specialized exudate recipe book that they use and they each bring in and nourish specialized microbial species. In turn, the microbial populations bloom around the roots while supplying nutrients for the plants. It's a relationship. The plants need the soil life, the soil life needs the plants, but the quality of this relationship and the consistency of maintaining it has wide-reaching effects on the health and productivity of the soil. Because not only are the microbes feeding the plants some nutrients, but they're also protecting them. You can kind of think of the soil like your own body in the same way that you can't just eat one salad in your life and you're good forever on energy and nutrition, neither can the soil. Like the human body, the soil needs a diverse and consistent supply of healthy food, you know, coming into it at all times. Mulches offer some small amount of that, but the primary source of food for the soil is root exudates with the molecular energy bars we call carbohydrates. And that happens from photosynthesis. Indeed, photosynthesis is to the soil what perhaps a pasta party is to a soccer team. It gives the soil the energy it needs to thrive. Pasta parties are a thing, right? Like that's like soccer teams get together the night before a big match and 
eat a bunch of pasta. Did I dream that? I mentioned earlier that all life on Earth is driven by photosynthesis, so let's just follow a bit of exudate from the plant to your body real quick. Let's say a bacterium consumes a little bit of root exudate. The bacterium then uses that energy, right? Because that's what we're talking about here. Carbohydrates and hence exudates are just stored energy from the sun. So let's say that bacterium consumes some of a root exudate from a plant. It can then use some of that energy to gather nutrients from the soil. But let's say that later a microarthropod or some other microscopic predator eats the bacterium. Then an earthworm perhaps eats that microarthropod. Then, I don't know, a chicken eats the earthworm, then the chicken lays an egg, and you have an omelet, and an absolute micro, micro, micro sliver of that original exudate that the bacterium consumed now becomes part of your body. Or you can just eat a spinach leaf, and that's a more direct way of getting some carbohydrates, but you get the point. What started out as water, sunlight, and carbon dioxide is now a part of you and many other creatures. In fact, if you'll allow me a little digression, we tend to think of carbon storage or sequestration as the carbon that stays in the soil. But the reality is that carbon sequestration is just as much about a mass of carbon-based life forms that live off of the soil as it is about the carbon that stays in the soil. Like, when colonists first arrived in the Americas, they saw enough birds to block out the sun. Millions and millions of geese and buffalo and beavers and all sorts of wildlife. This was the product, of course, of thousands of years of really brilliant, ingenious, indigenous land stewardship, something those early colonists exploited and rapidly destroyed. But those soils under the management of native stewards were not necessarily operating at unheard of carbon percentages. The soil organic matter of those soils was, as far as I can tell, excluding, you know, peat bogs, generally in the 8 to 10 percent range. Why? Because that's about when the soil fills up or saturates with soil organic matter. And when the soil fills up, it starts storing the carbon in other creatures, in life, in carbon-based life that soil microbes will later get to consume. So the health of the soil, in my eyes, is measured not solely by things like soil organic matter, but by the diversity of life it supports. Indeed, we and every other living thing on Earth is a carbon-based life form. We were all born in a plant, or 93 million miles away, on the surface of the sun, depending on how you look at it. I mean, how you look at things, don't look at the sun. What was this video supposed to be about? So the idea behind keeping the soil planted as much as possible is that there is nothing better for the soil than living plants. Photosynthesizing organisms like plants on land or things like algae on the water are what drives life on Earth. Not to mix metaphors here, but plants are sort of the solar panels for the solar battery. In order to keep the soil charged, full of energy, so to speak, we need plants. In fact, weeds are just emergency solar panels for the soil. The soil just wants to be covered. That's all it's asking when it puts up weeds. For its part, photosynthesis cools our planet which, you know, we could probably use a little more of right now. It gives us oxygen to breathe. I glossed over carbon sequestration there for a second, but plants can sequester and cycle an enormous amount of carbon through the soil. That 8 to 10% soil organic matter I mentioned is nothing to shake a stick at. It's not easy to achieve that, but that comes from a number of different types of carbon. Something like roots, which are a really long-lasting form of carbon. So we leave those in the soil after a bed flip. Um, but also that soil organic matter includes all the soil organisms living and dying in various stages of death and decay, and it's all put there by the plants. Also, this series is about soil conservation as much as it is about soil health, and few things keep the soil where it is better than living plant roots. Living roots also help to retain uh, and filter water. So what does this look like in modern agriculture? Well, where possible, the soil should never be left barren. If the soil is not getting fed, through photosynthesis, then it is just feeding on itself. It's consuming the stored carbon. It's largely releasing it in the form of CO2, as it always does. Carbon comes in, microbes eat it, and then release it as CO2, just like you and I do it. But without plant leaves there to recapture that CO2 for photosynthesis, the soil begins eating up all of its stored energy, and the CO2 created in that process escapes into the atmosphere, uncaptured. And so, when you go to plant into the soil again, it will be substantially less viable. So, keeping the soil planted can mean getting another crop in the ground, or perhaps just a quick cover crop. An example of that would be like 
our garlic patch. We plant our garlic in the fall. We harvest in late June or early July. We then immediately get a quick cover crop in those beds that is easily killed, such as buckwheat. We mow those down and sow the carrots as fast as we can. Once the fall carrots are out, we're back to winter cover crop. And the soil is never left more than a few days without something growing in it. In fact, in many cases, the soil isn't left open for even a few hours on our farm. One tool that enables us to replant so quickly is, well, transplants. You can't grow things like carrots and cell trays, really, but you can transplant chard and kale and broccoli and lettuce and tomatoes and so on. So by using transplants, growers can fill empty soil immediately with photosynthesizing plants. It's an incredible ability that humans have as stewards that nature can't always necessarily do on our own. We can fill unused space immediately with plants that are already established in soil mix and ready to start pumping uh, in those sunshine smoothies. On the other side of this, you can also over sow or under sow cover crops into existing crops. An example of this would be sowing a fall or winter cover crop into your fall brassicas like broccoli and Brussels sprouts. Essentially get the desired crop established, then go through with a seeder and sow the desired cover crop as thick as possible right before the bed is entirely overtaken by the canopy of the brassica in this case. There are a lot of relay cropping options like that, but uh, we will talk about all that and many intercropping things in a later video. And of course, I discuss a lot of this in my book, The Living Soil Handbook. Anyway, the idea is to just keep stuff growing as much as possible. So clear the bed quickly and then replant as fast as you can. But of course, don't be too hard on yourself here. If a crop fully comes out and then another crop is planted within 24 hours or so, you're absolutely killing it. Or, I mean, well, killing it in a good way. Anyway, nothing's going to enrich your soil with the added bonus of saving the dang planet more effectively than living plants. Otherwise, let me know your thoughts and questions. We will be continuing this series for the next little while, which will be rad, I promise. Uh, big thanks to Southern Sayre for the support. Also, speaking of support, thank you to all of our supporters at patreon.com slash no-till growers and to everyone who has purchased the Living Soil Handbook from no-tillgrowers.com. Or if you're outside of the U.S., just support a small bookseller in your area. That's rad too. Like this video if you like this video. And other than that, you all, Stay tuned for more nerdy detailed videos soon. Let me know what you think. We'll see you later. Bye.